Okay, right. Introducing Simon Miles, who has spoken before at the Bacon Society and um, also for bases on uh, crop circles, highly recommended. And today, this is the product of 25 years' work on Rennes de Chateau. So. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you here today at BASIS 2022 Christmas Conference. Let me start by saying a big thank you to Miles Johnston for inviting me here today and, and giving me this opportunity to speak. Well, everybody loves a good mystery. And for 25 years, I've been playing with a mystery, investigating it, researching it. It's the mystery of Rennes le Chateau. And to my mind, it's one of the most fascinating and curious nest of enigmas out there in the world. So Rennes le Chateau is a very small village in the south of France in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Now the mystery is really complicated and sprawling and very difficult to summarize, but it starts with a very simple story and the story is true enough. In the 1890s, a new priest arrived at this tiny village. The church, from, dated from the 9th century, was dedicated to Mary Magdalene and had fallen into, to disrepair, into disrepair, disrepair. The priest began to make some renovations and he removed the altar and underneath, apparently, he found something. What he found has been subject to much conjecture, but apparently he found some parchments. And so the story goes, he was able to decode these parchments and they led him to something which in turn led him to essentially unlimited riches. And from that time on, he had a supply of money which didn't dry up. He rebuilt the church, he built himself a villa, he dined on the finest wines, he had wallpaper from Paris, and he lived the high life. Nobody ever found out where the money came from to this day, and it spawned hundreds of books, more books than there, than there are residents in the village. Now, it has to be said that not everything about the story is fully true, although you can visit the village today and you can see the results of his building program and certainly that part is real. But things have been inserted into the story so that the story itself is a mixture of true history and false history. In fact, you might even say it's a red herring and a cover story because the story of Rennes le Chateau isn't really a treasure hunt, even though that's the way it's being presented to the world. It hides something, something else. So the mystery first came to prominence in the 1960s when a book in France was published, which brought it to the wider world. And in the English-speaking world in the 1970s, when a chap called Henry Lincoln, who was a BBC author and writer, and produced a series of three documentaries which are shown on the BBC. And some of you, I'm sure, will, will remember seeing some of those. They were quite influential. He then wrote a book called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail with two other authors, which was a huge bestseller. Many other books have followed, culminating in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, which was a worldwide bestseller in 2008 or around then, based on these events. Well, <clears throat> my involvement with all this began on a completely different element of it. I had no real interest in treasure stories, no real particular interest in, in, in the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. But my interest was piqued when I came across this book in the early 1990s. And it's a book that perhaps some of you recognise. It's called The Holy Place, and it's written by Henry Lincoln, who started the, the ball rolling. But this book describes an entirely different aspect to the mystery of Rennes Chateau. In this book, Henry Lincoln claimed to have discovered a network of alignments in the landscape between mountain peaks, churches, and chateaus. Now, this entire region, and we're talking the southeast corner of France, we're talking the, the foothills of the Pyrenees on the northern side, is a very, very fascinating area. It's dotted with extraordinary chateaus built by the Templars, uh, and it's full of amazing history. The Cathars, the Troubadours, all kinds of uh, extraordinary things have happened over the years there. It dates back to megalithic times, the Romans were there, there's been waves of migration. But Henry Lincoln discovered that on the 1 to 25,000 map, scale map of the area, he could join mountains, churches and chateaus and create alignments. Many of these alignments fell into parallel lines, some were at axes, some seemed to point in significant directions. Think ley lines. Well, when I came across this book, and it was the early 90s, I was fascinated by this book and I'd never come across anything quite like it before. 
And I thought, you know what, if, 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 if this is real, then this is really one of the most extraordinary places on earth. And I decided to take it on as a personal project, as a side hobby, having no idea that it would actually end up taking over my entire life. But what I thought I would do was, was, was simply take the time to check his results. So this was the early, before the days of the internet, I wrote to Paris, I received back in the post three months later the map, and I started working through Henry's book and checking line by line, page by page, his results. Now, very, very quickly, here's what I found. I found that the alignments, by and large, existed, and they're extraordinary. There are very many examples of four, five, or six churches or chateaus in a perfect straight line. But I was disappointed where he tried to make those into shapes or greater geometries. That part of the book didn't convince me. All right, so that was 25 years ago. A lot's happened in that time. And I'd like to take you through now some of the results that, that, that I've arrived at. I'm going to plunge right in to begin and pick one line out of all the lines that Henry presented to the world in this book. And I want to talk to you about this line. I call it the 45 degree alignment. Now, throughout the, the lecture, I'm going to be showing you slides that I've made with Google Earth rather than the original 1 to 25,000 map. And I, and I must say, everything on the, is exact on the map. Sometimes in Google Earth, it's not apparent how exact it is. But but on the, on, on, on the topographic map, all these results are perfectly accurate. So here we have five locations on a perfect line, a perfect straight line. This is the church in a small village called St. Just et Le This is a Templar commandery site called La Val Dieu, the Valley of God. This is the church in a village called Ren le -Ban. This is a chateau that the Templars built called Chateau Montferrand. And this is another chateau called the Chateau d'Arc. Now, Henry talked about this line in his book, and in fact, he hadn't discovered it. It was discovered by someone else in another book about this topic, but neither of them remarked on something that I noticed, and that was that the line was at an angle of 45 degrees to north, and I thought this was very significant. Now, all these sites date from at least 11th, 12th century, possibly earlier. So we're talking about very old. So here we are, five sites, all from the 11th to 12th century, all in a straight line, and that line at an exact 45 degrees angle. Now here is the Chateau d'Arc, Chateau d'Arc, at the northeast corner of the line. Many of these Templar chateaus are built on the tops of mountain peaks and high points where they have strategic vision. This one is different. It's on a large, flat expanse of ground and it has a very unusual architectural style. As you can see, it's this large square tower. Now here is a diagram of the floor plan of this. And you can see here, here's the tower in the middle and it's surrounded by a rectangular compound. And I've drawn the 45 degree alignment and actually, as you can see, it passes right through the tower. And the tower actually has these diagonals marked on it. And so the 45 degree line literally crosses across the diagonal of the tower. Well, that's nice. But the other thing I want to point out is in the corner of the compound, there's this guardhouse. And it's a similar design with a square cross section and diagonals. This 45 degree line passes also through that guardhouse in the corner of the compound. Now, I might point out that the compound is not, is not a square, and so that's not true of any other of the corners here. So the only corner that passes through the corner and the arc square is that one on the 45-degree alignment. So I thought this was all very interesting, and I thought this, this tended to suggest that there was something more going on with this 45-degree alignment than just random chance. This seemed to me a really good candidate for a deliberate, intentional, sighting of these five buildings on this line. Well, but why? Okay, so I've been able to now produce Google Earth Studio videos in high resolution, and I'm going to be using those today through to show you. And I think this is a really great way to see the sort of landscape that this work's been done in. So here we are, this is the 45, this is the Mediterranean over here, this is Perpignan down here, this is Carcassonne up here, and now we're going to fly over and zoom in as if we're in a drone. We're going to zoom now along this 45 degree line. Here we go. First of all, the church. We're going to fly over that. Now we're going to fly over La Val Dieu, the Templar commandery, Ren Le Ban, the first chateau, and the Chateau d'Arc. So you see, this is this wonderful landscape of hills and valleys where 
there's plenty of high points and there's plenty of low points in between. And this is looking back, and this is the high Pyrenees behind and beyond that Spain on the other side. Okay, so that was how my journey began. So there are many lines in Henry's, in Henry's book and in the other books on this topic. And it, after a year or two in this, in, this, in this exercise of mine, I was lost. I had so many lines on my map, it was a mess. And I, I stopped and I thought, you know what, I, I, want, I want to approach this in a different way. And an idea occurred to me, and this was the idea. I thought to myself, okay, let's say that some at least of these lines are genuine, are intentional interventions in the landscape by presumably humans at an early era. Well, if that's the case, then, then one of those lines must have been the first line, okay? If there's a program of lines, they had to start somewhere. Well, if they started somewhere, what would that first line be? And when I thought about that, a ready answer presented itself. Perhaps a meridian was the first line. After all, a meridian, which is a north-south line, it's the first line we draw any time we build any building or lay out any piece of land, even to this day. So I went looking for meridians marked in mountain peaks or churches or chateaus on the map. And I did so by getting my map, putting the ruler, and moving my ruler across a line vertically one day without much expectation of success, but I thought it was a worthwhile exercise. Well, I got halfway across the map and I discovered the first one. Now, the first thing I noticed was the two that you can see up the top. That first is Le Sarah Rouge, it means the Red Hill. It's the, most, it's the highest point in that whole area. It's a very prominent little uh, landmark. Below it is La Pique, which is another very prominent landmark. To this day, it's a, it's, it's a lookout where you can get a 360 panoramic view of the landscape. And I noticed that those two points, both local high points, fell on an exact north-south line. It was the meridian of 2 degrees, 17 minutes, 50 seconds east. Well, I thought, well, that's a good start. But then as I traced that line further south, I noticed that it passed over these two ridges. And as I leant in and looked at my map, I noticed to my amazement that the very point at which it crossed each of those ridges was the highest point on each of those ridges. So we had four points now, four local clearly marked highest points on a perfect north-south alignment. And not only that, notice how that they increase in size as you head south. Each one is larger than the one before. And that made me think, well, gee, does that mean that there's a, a place further to the north where you can stand and look south and see, see those mountains? Because if so, you would see them, um, imagine that, stacked up vertically as you look south. Now, there's a cross section, and you can see there, you can see there's the, the, the four peaks. That, that's a slice taken through north-south, and you can see how they, 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 they rise in height. And here again is a video that I've made. And in fact, there was an excellent vantage point on a long east-west ridge which crosses the landscape here. And the point where this meridian crossed the sighting ridge is a place called Lommore with the uncanny name of the dead man. So here we go now. We're going to zoom in and swoop over the meridian first, over the sighting ridge. Long more. So you stand there and you look to the south, and now you see these four points. Here's the first one, Le Sarah Rouge. Now the second one, La Pique. And now the two ridges behind that as we fly over first the first one, and now over the second one. And so you can see that it's not just on the map, actually these are real. And something I haven't really drawn attention to, but if you look at this mountain up here, in the Actually, that is on the same meridian. The meridian actually continues on to that point. Well, I was so excited about that. I was leaping around. I couldn't believe what I'd found. And eventually, I calmed down. And I realized I'd only made my way halfway across the map. So then I resumed, and I kept going. And two minutes later, I found the second example. This one was even better. This is at 2 degrees, 19 minutes, 40 seconds. This one passes through 10 peaks on a perfect north-south alignment. This top one up here is on that sighting ridge and it's the highest point on the whole sighting ridge. Peshkar Do here is one of the most significant mountains in the whole area. Now, this word Kardo actually means meridian in Latin. So this is Mount Meridian and through this is a meridian. There's another seven points here, and then the final one is the largest mountain in the whole area, Peshtes and Karabatets. So we have these two mountains, which are the two most prominent 
interesting mountains in the area and the meridian, one of them actually called Mount Meridian, the meridian passes through those and through another eight high points. Now one of those here, this Col du Vent, I've given a little excerpt of it over on the right here, this is the exception to the rule. It's not actually the high point, but what it is, is a V-shaped groove in the crest where the meridian crosses, and as you can see from this little excerpt from the map, and I've blown it up here, the meridian crosses this ridge at the exact point where a road also crosses it. Now this is the only point on the ridge where, this, where it's possible for the road to cross over, and that road has been there centuries, perhaps millennia, because it, it is the only place to cross. And so here we have the road, the V-shaped uh, groove, and the meridian all coinciding in space and time, demonstrating in that case, that humans were definitely at at least one of this point on the meridian in the past. There's the side view on the left, number one, that's the high point on the sighting ridge. There's Peshkar Do, there's the others, and there's Encarabatats at the end. And I've got a video of this as well. This time we're swooping in from the north towards the south. I've marked in the 45 degree alignment as well, so you can see that they actually cross each other. And there's the Pyrenees behind, just to give some, some sense of the scale and where we are. Okay, here we go. Here's the sighting ridge, Plan Dito, the highest point. This is the magnificent Peshkar Do. Next point, next point, next point. Here is the V-shaped groove called Duvant, and you can see the road crossing there. Here's another local high point. Here's the highest point on that crest. And here is this extraordinary mountain, Pesh del Zenkarapetets. So, I had now found two meridians next to each other. Now, okay, let's stop. What is a meridian in mountain peaks? What is that? That's not a category of anything that's ever existed or anyone's heard of before. How, how could mountains be in a straight line on a north-south? It doesn't even make sense. There's only two possibilities, isn't it? Isn't Either it's natural or it's been created. Now, Nature has no mechanism by which it arranges mountains on a north-south line. You, you might get a map and you might find randomly the occasional, but not four and then ten next to each other, also with a 45 degree in advance. So as you can see, what's starting to emerge here is a system. What's emerging here is a complex. What's emerging here is a, is a geometric machine. I've dropped the camera down now. We're looking at, a, at, at, at an angle across, again, from south to north. Here's Pesh Desincarabatets down there. And you can see this end is starting to get up into the higher Pyrenees, whereas this is, 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 is slightly lower. Now I've flipped around. He, here we're looking from the sighting ridge down south with the 45. And I've got one more video to show you. So let's again fly over and see this glorious sight of these two meridians perfectly marked in the highest points, right next to each other, with a 45 degree line running between them, almost like, you know, in carpentry, you make a pair of uprights, you put a 45 against it to brace it. And now the camera just rises up and you can peek over the high Pyrenees, down into Spain and Barcelona and that territory beyond there. Okay, well, this work I did in the, in, in the 90s, uh, and then the internet came along, and I came online, I discovered a thriving community of forums and websites and people, and it was all very exciting. And then the 2000s came, and I took it about as far as I could, and I got on with other things in my life. And then in 2006, an incredible series of synchronistic events happened to me out of the blue, and all of a sudden I found myself, without expecting to be there, in France, at Rennes Chateau for the first time in my life. For the next few years, I was traveling back and forwards from there to Australia, which as you can probably tell is where I came from. And I ended up living there. I moved there in, in 2010. I met my dear wife, Judith, and we got married. And we moved into a tiny little terraced house in a village called Far, two letters, which was actually on the map that I'd been studying and obsessing about for a decade. There I was now living in a little black square on the map. Now this is the Far Tower. This is an amazing tower. No one's really sure how old it was. And it's built on the hill next to the village of Far. And every morning before breakfast, I used to trot up to there when the weather was fine and watch the sunrise literally over the mountains that I've been obsessing about. And this is the view from the Far Tower across to the east. This is Peshkar Do over here. These are the ridges over here to the right that the meridians pass over. 
So I would head up there before breakfast. I would watch the most sensational sunrises over that. Then I would head down the hill and at 8 o'clock every morning, the van from the boulangerie, the, the bakery, would pull up literally outside our front door and we would buy fresh croissants and fresh baguettes and put on the coffee and literally it was pretty much as good as life gets, really. Well, one day I was up at the tower, the Tour de Far, and I was looking out and I noticed to my surprise that several kilometres away, between the valleys, I could spot the church in the village of Esperanza down the valley. That surprised me because I didn't think they'd be interdivisible, intervisible between each other because of the, of the valleys. So when I got home and I checked on my map, I discovered to my amazement that not only could I see the church and the village from the tower, but it was directly due east of the tower. Then I discovered that the church and the village of Campania sur Ode down here formed a perfect equilateral triangle with those first two points. Now, this is a very fascinating village. It was the headquarters of the Knights Templar in the entire area. And you'll see later, it has a central core of the village where the church is. I also noticed that this line extended, terminated on the summit of this mountain here, Mount Sec, another long local prominent landmark. I slowly realised that what I was looking at was the remnants of a communication network. That it's possible to send signals between these different locations by line of sight between the spots. And it occurred to me that this was a very useful thing to be able to do in, 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 this, in this landscape because to this day it's a very difficult landscape to move, move around. It's, it's, it's very hilly, it's very, the, the, the roads are windy. But this offers you a potential opportunity to send messages around the landscape via line of sight between key positions very easily. Well, I soon discovered that I was by no means the first person to find this out. In fact, there's, there's quite a literature on this, and it's a well-known thing. The Templars were using this line of sight network. They inherited it from the Romans, who used it when they were there, and the Romans, in, in turn, had already found it in existence when they got there. So it, it dates from, from the me megalithic times, it appears. There has been a network of sighting positions in this area. But what didn't seem to have been noticed by anyone that I could see up to this point was that the sighting network also conformed to a geometry. And if you think about it, the geometrical aspect seems to be redundant. If, you're, if you've got a line of sight communication network, it, there's no need for the lines to be east-west or 30 degrees or form equilateral triangles. So I started to get the feeling that though we had a very practical situation here with a sighting network, there were obviously elements to this machine, if you like, that did other things as well. Okay, well, I, I got to move there and, and, and live there and I explored every square inch of the territory and that also meant that I got to see these meridians for myself. This is the view from Longmore looking south at the La Peak Meridian. Now, it's quite difficult to see during the day. It's, it's hazy, it, it's fuzzy. And that's kind of the point. As we'll see later, this is done at night with fires on the peaks. During the day, it's difficult to see. Now, within the black box there, that's where the meridian is. And now I'll just zoom in. And again, I've just used a black pen to mark. So this is Le Sora Rouge down here. This is La Peak, and this is the two um, ridges. So I could see with my own eyes, not only on the map, not only on Google Earth, but also in my pre the presence in the landscape, these meridians exist. This is taken from Le Sera Rouge, looking at the other three points in the La Peak meridian. There's La Peak, there's the two ridges. So you can see it's not dramatic, it's subtle, but there we have a, a meridian creased into the landscape. Once you know it, you know it's there. And there's a close-up again, there's the highest point of the ridge, there's the highest point, there's La Peak. This is a side view of Le Sera Rouge, the first of that, the, the red hill, and you can see it's got a very interesting kind of shape, almost sphinx-like, if you look at these legs coming out. It is a very curious thing. I wouldn't like to say it's a man-made structure, but it's a very curious little lump of, 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 of boulders and earth, and it certainly has a nice symmetrical shape. This is La Pique. If you walk to La Pique today, this is what greets you out of the end. There's this tree, there's a geodetic marker, and there's a sensational 360-degree panoramic view. This is Peshkar Do over here. This is the highest point on that fourth ridge, and you can see it's actually, it's not just a random point, it's a very sort of prominent, interesting sort of outcrop of rock. 
This is the second meridian, the Peshkar Doe meridian. Uh, this is taken from the south flank of Peshkar Doe, looking south. In the back, there's Pesh and Karabatets, the big, the big mountain at the end. And again, it's kind of hard to see during the day. There's a close-up, but there's the V-shaped groove. There's the next one, and the, and the subsequent ones uh, are in front of it. This is the V-shaped groove, Col du Vent. This is the point exactly here where the meridian crosses that ridge where the road crosses it. Now, I was always curious, on the top of these ridges, what was I going to find? You know, like, have they literally shaped this ridge to make that point the highest point? And when I got up on these, to these ridges on wonderful old tracks which have been there literally for millennia and probably two people per hundred years pass down these days, but when I walked down these tracks on the top of these ridges, this is what I found literally everywhere up there. Evidence of stone working on a huge scale, like literally an army of stone masons have been here digging up every piece of the limestone and no doubt carting it down into the valleys to build all their churches and houses and chateaus, but also at the same time demonstrating that, that they were literally changing the shape of the landscape. I also made it to the final peak, Peshtas Dels and Karabatets, and now here I am on the, on, on the peak looking north, there's Peshkar Doe, there's Plandito, that's a lovely panorama. This is Bugarash, for those of you who know the area. And here's a close-up, so here's looking north, here's Peshkar Doe, and that's the highest point of the sighting ridge, Plandito, and you can see it is the hiding, highest point. Unfortunately, I couldn't really see the rest of it. And where I took that previous photo, so this is, I've now turned around, and this is the actual summit of the mountain. I couldn't get a good view from there. So after I took this photo, I walked back up here, and I stood here, and here I was on the top of the world, the Pyrenees around me, perfect day, blue sky, I could see forever in every direction, I just drank it all in, it was a magnificent moment. And then I heard, very close to me, the sound of a large growl, and I froze, and then it did it again, and it was a bear, and the bear was kind of there, <laughs> about 20 feet away from me. And uh, it was a very fascinating moment, and uh, I gathered my thoughts, and then I ran as fast as I could down the other side, down crashing through the forest, where I picked up Judith at the bottom, who was gathering wild strawberries in the forest, and <laughs> I couldn't really talk. I said, God. Anyway, so I survived my encounter with the great bear on the top of the mountain. That was one of my favorites. Okay. All right, so that's the meridians and the 45-degree line. Now, I'm not going to introduce too many different elements of the geometry today, but I'm going to introduce one more. Now, this is these two purple axes. They're known as the Sunrise Line and the Bugarash Baseline. Now, this is in Henry Lincoln's book, and this is a pair of lines that he, in fact, didn't, didn't discover. It was discovered by another chap called David Wood, who wrote a book called Genesis about this same... So he discovered these two axes at right angles to each other, and I always thought that was very interesting at right angles. Again, an indication of intentionality. But Henry Lincoln pointed something else out about this line. He said, this line here, the Bugarash baseline, he said it's divided into three equal points by this church, Bugarash, by this hill, La Sulan, by the point where they two cross, and this point here, Combe Lubier, which is, is a point where three trackways meet. So Henry Lincoln pointed out that those three distances were the same. Now, I've always been very interested in the measures that might be used in, 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 such a, in such a complex as this. So I was in the habit of taking any of these lengths and converting them back and forwards into every different unit of measure I could, I could think of to see if anything sig significant would turn up. And what, So what I did here was I measured these lengths. Yes, they worked out great in millimetres. I converted them to everything, and I discovered that those three lengths could be accurately represented, perfectly accurately, as three lengths of 150,000 inches. All right, well, that's good. That, maybe that's it. That, that, that's interesting. Um, it's a nice round figure. It divides the lengths into three readily. Then I went to check it, and I turned back to my 1 to 25,000 map, and then something happened which has turned out to be, for me, a magic moment in this whole journey. I had to work out how long the 150,000 inches would be represented by on a 25,000 scale map. Well, I went to my calculator, and then I realized, well, I don't need my calculator. It's obvious. It's six, six inches, right? Because... 150,000 divided by 6 is 25,000, okay? So 150,000 inches on a map, on a 25,000 scale map, will be represented by a length of 6 inches. 6 inches. 
Well, I scrambled around to find a ruler marked in inches because Australia had converted to metric by then, but I found one. And indeed, six inches, six inches, six inches. And suddenly it hit me like a thunderclap. I'd been looking for examples of measurements in the landscape that might conform to nice whole round numbers in units of measurement. But it never occurred to me to think of looking for measurements on the map. In whole, uh, because why would it? The map surely is our map, 1 to 25,000. If they used a map, they, they would have used a different scale. But the thought never left me. What if the ancients, whoever they were, in laying this out, did use a map, and the scale was 25,000, and the unit of measure was inches? In that case, look at that. There's a, there's a degree of order between the map the scale, the measure, and the landscape. Well, it wasn't enough to go on, but it was an interesting thought that I never quite got rid of. What I did discover was that this pair of lines, when extended in either directions, actually landed on other points. So the Bugarach baseline, when I extended it south, I discovered it went exactly to the church in this major town down here called Cordier de Fenied. To the north, it came to this place called Gir Baku, which is also on the sighting ridge. To the east, it terminated on a very prominent and spectacular chateau called the Chateau de Villarouge Terminus, which in my bad French is a bad French joke that I translate that the chateau of the red city at the end of the line. And at the other end, the line terminates on the peak of the most holy, highest and important mountain in the whole area, the peak to St. Barthelemy. Well, I was astounded by this because these alignments were very good and very accurate. Again, I've made a video and so what we're going to do now is swoop in over and just get a feel for what we're looking at. So there's the Bugarach baseline, here's Cordier de Fenier down the bottom, here's the, the Red City at the end of the line and here is Peak de St. Barthelemy overseeing the whole thing and now we're going to swoop a sweep around. Now this has always been a very important geodetic mountain. Whenever surveys are done they use this mountain because it, it has such a superb view over the whole area. Now we go swooping along. All right so Henry Lincoln had said something else about this line. He said that the line, he called it the sunrise line because he said it corresponded with the sunrise on July the 22nd the feast day of Mary Magdalene, and therefore, if you were at the church of Renle Chateau, and Renle Chateau is one of the sites on this line, if you're on the church, on the feast day, the sun rises along, along the sunrise line. So there's pages of that in Henry's book. Well, by the time I got to it, of course, I had the internet, the internet and software, I was, and I was able to check it. And I discovered to my amazement that that was completely false. The sun on July 22nd rose nowhere near this line. It was like 11 degrees away. So I then used the Stellarium software to figure out what day the sun did rise along this line. And the day was August the 24th, okay, August the 24th. Now, just park that fact over and we'll come back to that in a moment. The next thing I discovered when I started reading about this mountain, the Peak de Saint Barthélemy, I discovered a very fascinating piece of cultural historical information. It's named the Peak de Saint Barthélemy after Saint Barthélemy and his feast day is August the 24th. Now it turns out that for hundreds of years, if not millennia, the villagers who lived at the base of the mountain have had a ritual where on the night before they would climb to the top of the mountain, they would spend the night on the mountain and they would watch the sunrise on August the 24th from the summit of this mountain and that has been happening since time immemorial. Well, no one seems to have noticed that this sunrise on August 24th actually takes place along this very line, the sunrise line, which had been identified by Henry Lincoln and David Wood and misidentified as the sunrise of July 22nd. Now here's an image from Google Earth where I've dialed up. In fact, it's, 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 it's good today. It works today. There's the 24th of August 2022. There's the sun rising. If you are on the summit of Peak to St. Barthelemy, on that morning you would see the sun rise along this line. And just for the heck of it, I made another video because I became sort of obsessed about them. Here's the sun rising from the summit, the glorious Pyrenees. All right. Now this was an incredible moment for me in my journey because 
At this point, the different waveforms collapsed, as it were. All these books about this landscape geometry in Rennes Chateau, it's all very speculative. Everyone wants to find something real. Is it real? Is it not? But here was an example where the line corresponded exactly with a ritual that has taken place in culture and history here for hundreds of years and thousands of years. It's now impossible for this line not to be an intentional line because the villagers have been climbing this mountain for millennia to watch the sun rise along, along this line. So this was one of the moments where I realised that this geometry is absolutely real. Okay, well I hadn't got to the bottom of the meridians, I had still a few more to find. One of this really spectacular chateau in the middle of this whole area is called Chateau Bezu. And this is a wonderful image that uh, I took from up there, nearly 360 panorama. This is Bugarach here in the middle, Cardo over to the right. And I want to zoom in. See this bit here with, with, with Bugarach? I'm just going to zoom in on that and I want to point something out. You see this bit here? This is another Templar chateau at a place called Peopatus which is a long way away. It's like 20 miles away. This is very hilly, mountainous country. Again, if you looked at these on a map, you would think there was no way that Bezu and Peopatus were intervisible between each other. But in fact, you can see that it just happens to peek over this little gap between the mountains. So this is more evidence of this sighting network that's been installed here. Well, it turns out that there's a meridian also emanating from Bezu, from the, sh from, from the chateau. And it actually comes from the chapel, which is at the eastern end. Two degrees, 18 minutes, 28 minutes east. And if you go down there, it passes through first a peak, then the church in this major city here, La Pradelle, then up now into this valley, into the high Pyrenees. Another church, two more peaks, and finally the church in this very high alpine mountain at Montfort sur Boulzane. Absolutely incredible meridian through seven points through the high Pyrenees. So that was the third meridian I found. There's the cross section. And then there was another two. One through La Valdieu, which even though there's only two on that, this is one of the most spectacular sites in the whole Pyrenees, the Chateau puy la -Rand. And both puy la -Rand and La Valdieu, both Templar strongholds, are on the same meridian. 2 degrees, 18 minutes, 0 seconds. And another meridian passes through Ren Laban. Both of those on the 45. So, I had five meridians. Now, one meridian, well, you might say that's a coincidence, but five meridians all stacked up next to each other with a 45 degree alignment going through the, the middle. What are we looking at? I'll tell you what one of the things we're looking at here. We're looking at an astronomical instrument. The practical purpose of meridians is to observe the transits of heavenly bodies. So you stand up here on the sighting ridge and you look to the south along these meridians, calibrated directly due south, and you wait and watch as the stars and the suns and the planetary bodies go over there, and you observe them and you time them. Now, this would be really interesting if there was some kind of regular division or known spacing between these meridians because you could then track the stars, you could time them, you could make all kinds of fascinating calculations about the size of the Earth and the size of uh, and the speed of the planets. So here we are looking from the sighting ridge to the south. Here they are. Each of the five meridians terminates on a local high point on, on this sighting ridge. There they are. There's Lomor, there's Plandito, there's the other three. And you can see heading back into the mountains. And yes, I've got another video. Here we go. We're going to now swoop in over all five. <coughs> you are gazing at an ancient, exquisite, highly accurate astronomical instrument which has been inscribed into the very shape of the mountains. Here's Pesh in Karabatet, and now here's the Bezu Meridian still going. This is looking from the south to the north. This shows you how far up the Bezu Meridian goes into the High Meridian, High Pyrenees. And if you're not sick of these videos, I've got one more. Swooping from south to north along what I call the Field of the Meridians. Here we are, Montfort sur Boulzane. Again, you see the territory here. These two mountain peaks, highest point. This amazing village, another amazing village, another high point. The rest of the complex, the Sighting Ridge. Okay, 
So, there's another village called Rennes, a couple of kilometers to the east of Rennes le Chateau. It's called Rennes les Bains. Rennes le Chateau is Rennes the Castle. Rennes les Bains is Rennes the Baths. And this is a very fascinating little village, and there's been people coming here to take the thermal waters for literally thousands of years. There's Roman baths in ruins still here. And this is the centre of the square, and it's called the Place des Deux Rennes, the two Rennes, referring to Rennes Chateau, the other village. Now, at the same time as the priest came to Rennes Chateau, who I told you about before, who got rich, there was another priest in, in, in this village, and he was also a very fascinating character. His name was... Henri, Henri Boudet, and he wrote this book called La Vraie Langue Celtique, The Real Celtic Language, Et le Cromlec de Rennes Laban, and The Stone Circle of Rennes Laban. Now, this is a very mysterious book, 1886. No one's really been able to figure this out for 150 years. The book itself has all kinds of strange things in it, but the strangest thing is this map that's in the back of the book that was published with it. Now, this is a very, very fine puzzle that sat in the public domain since the 1880s. The engraver didn't make this map up. He copied the engraving from a national cartographic project that the French had undertaken in the, in the 18th century. But he changed the scale of the map. And this is the first thing that's odd about this map. This is a map of rennes le Bain in the middle here and, and, and the surrounds around rennes le Bain. What's odd about this map is the scale isn't listed anywhere. What's even odder is that there's no coordinate system. There's no grid, there's no coordinate, there's no indication of where the heck this map is. So a map without a scale and without any, any kind of coordinate system is essentially completely useless. So for 150 years, people have wondered, well, what was this map all about? Why did he produce this such useless map? There's another funny thing about this map. It's got this funny title up the top here, Ren Celtic, Celtic, in these very f kind of weird letters. All right, well, one day I cracked the puzzle, and I'm now about to reveal to you the answer to this puzzle, which has remained unresolved for 150 years, and here it is. See that word Ren there? That word in the original map, at the original scale of the map, and by the way, the book, Boudet's book was re-released re in the 1970s in two new edition, facsimile editions. There's, there's one of them, so it's, it's quite readily available in, in France, and it included the map with it, so it's, 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 it's quite straightforward to get a, a hold of this original map. So. That word Ren turns out to be exactly two inches long and exactly half an inch high. Now, that doesn't sound very much, but that is an extraordinary breakthrough. It's two inches long and half an inch high. And if you then add a grid to that map based on that word Ren and extrapolate it across, this grid reveals itself as the secret concealed hidden grid of the map. Now, the first and easiest way to see that is to see what happens. These squares are half-inch squares. So you see that Ren itself now is four squares long and, two, and one square high. And if you continue the grid across to the left, you will notice that this grid line on the left coincides exactly with the border of the map. And that is a signal from the puzzle maker telling you that you've solved it. If you look on the rest of the map, you'll see, for example, there's all kinds of places on the map where... The, the writing on the map and the designs actually adhere to this underlying grid. And I've got a few more examples here. At the top, you'll see the Ren Celtic. Now below, that's the legend at the bottom right-hand corner of the map. And I've divided those half-inch squares down into six. So these are 12th-inch squares. And you'll see beyond any doubt that the writing here is absolutely written on this grid of 1 12th inches, and there's more examples down here. There's absolutely no doubt at all that the entire map has been based around this grid, which has then been removed. All right. What is the scale of the map? Well, you can tell what the scale is because you can measure the distance between two points. You can compare that with the, the map. You can do the calculation. When I did the calculation, the scale of the map is 1 to 25,000. Boudet used the scale of 1 to 25,000. Now, why did he choose that scale? So now that I had the scale, I was able to take Boudet's map and superimpose it on Google Earth at the correct scale in the correct location, which I then did. And then I turned on my meridians. 
Now, these three meridians are the three inner meridians that I found, that second shot, the second lot that I showed you. The meridian of Love Algier, the meridian through Bezu, and the meridian through Ren Laban. And you will notice that those three meridians correspond perfectly without any deviation whatsoever to the grid lines on Boudet's map. Can you see that? That is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing if you think about it because I've really brought together two completely different solutions here to two different problems. On the one hand, I claim to have found meridians in the landscape. Here we are. Over here, I claim to have found a hidden grid on Boudet's map. Well, that's all very well. But when I put the two together, I find that the grids exactly correlate with the grid lines on Boudet's map, thus mutually reinforcing the f suggestion that, in fact, I've found the correct solutions to both problems. Now, what this indicates to me, if I can be so bold, is that the meridians are real and that knowledge of these meridians persisted down into the modern era, into the ears of Boudet the priest, who decided to recreate this knowledge in this map. Now, <clears throat> there's one or two things to notice here. Think of these two first and then we're, we're done. And I know lunch is, lunch is ready, so we're about two minutes away. Think of these two meridians. As you can see, they're separated by two grid squares. The grid squares are half an inch, so those two meridians are one inch apart on the map, right? One inch apart. But they're also 28 arc seconds apart. Look at that. It's 2 degrees 18 minutes 0 seconds east and 2 degrees 18 minutes 28 seconds each. So in angular measure, the distance between the two lines is 28 arc seconds. Right? Remember, 60 arc seconds makes one arc minute. 60 arc minutes makes one degree, 360 degrees makes a circle. So, <clears throat> on the 1 to 25,000 scale map, it's apparent that 1 each equals 28 arc seconds. But it's also apparent that in the landscape, if it's 1 inch on the map and it's a 20, 1 to 25,000 scale map, then in the landscape it's got to be 25,000 inches, right? So in the landscape, 25,000 inches is equal to 28 arc seconds. So, well, this is very curious. We seem to have a very nice relationship between inches, arc seconds, and the scale of this map. Now, I need to point out that this only, it's only the case that this is true at this latitude. As soon as you go any distance south or any distance north, if you think of two meridians, they get closer together as they go to the, to the North Pole and further apart. This is the only place, this, this latitude here, where 28 arc seconds does equal 25,000 inches. So this map is at the one location on the Earth in terms of latitude where this is true. It relates to meridians which were intentionally inserted in the landscape and it appears that knowledge about this has persisted into the modern world. So here we have the indication that this astronomical device or machine or instrument has been laid out in such a way to enable you to convert between inches and arc seconds and the scale very easily, very readily. So it's very easy and uh, straightforward to perform the kinds of astronomical calculations that you want to do when you're making your observations. Now I'll just finish on this note. The parchments which were said to have been found by, by the priest who got, who, who got rich it was long ago proved that, that they are a 20th century concoction. They were not, the, par the parchments that were put into the public domain in the 1960s were certainly not whatever Saunier found in the 1890s. Well, I'll tell you what the parchments are. The parchments are a reinterpretation of Boudet's map. The parchments, for those who know the story of the parchments, and this is all in my book, which you can see further, and for those at home who are, who are watching on, the parchments contain a secret one-inch grid, and they contain the same information as the Boudet map. So the secret of the Renle Chateau parchments is that they are a reinterpretation of the secret hidden grid design in Boudet's map, which itself is a revelation of the ancient meridians in the landscape. Let's do lunch. See you after lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so, the, so the 45 degree alignment, which I, I showed you at the beginning of, of, of slide one, so I've been thinking about that alignment for, for, for nearly 20 years, and I've got to tell you that it's acted almost as a time capsule, almost as a, think of a bud opening up as a flower. So the 45 degree line I stared at for a decade before I noticed something about it, and then another decade before I noticed something else. So I want to share with you some of the hidden dimensions of the 45 degree alignment. But first of all, I want to take a left turn and take a diversion across to Greece. So this is a map of ancient Greece. And you'll see right in the middle, Delphi. And around Delphi, you'll see a series of alignments which divide the entire region around Greece into 12 equal segments. Now, I've taken this diagram from a book by an author called Professor Jean Rochet, who wrote a series of fascinating books in French, only one of which has been translated into English, in which he discovered that many sites in the ancient world, starting with Delphi, lay at the centre of what he calls landscape zodiacs, that the ancients arranged the landscape to reflect the order of the heavens above. And typically, for example, cities, say Corinth here is in the Leo segment, if you look at the coins of Corinth, you'll see a lion on the reverse. So Richet found out that typically the cities in the segments have iconography which reflects the zodiac sign. Now, this is a really fascinating area that hasn't really sort of found its mark in the world, and particularly in the, in the English-speaking world. As I say, there's only one book. But this is a very fascinating set of ideas that I was really getting into at one stage in my life, quite separately from the Renle Chateau mystery. All right, let's go back to Renle Chateau. Now, this is a diagram that I've copied from a book which I picked up when I was over there, Histoire de Renle Laban, The History of Renle Laban. And this book displays the ancient Roman axes of the village of Ren Laban, the Cardo axis and the Decumanus axis. Now, recall that in the ancient world, the Romans would always arrange their cities around a vertical and a horizontal, or a north south and an east west line, known as the Cardo and the Decumanus. Now, in this case, the, De the Cardo doesn't run north south, it runs at an angle. And this is because Ren Laban, the village, is squeezed into a narrow strip of land behind, beside the river in, an, in a narrow valley, and the river runs at about 15 degrees angle bearing to north. So the main axis of the city of the village runs along this axis next to the river, and that's why the Cardo and the Decumanus are offset at this 15 degree angle. So this, this Roman system of, of civic architecture was flexible. They, they, they would always make allowance for local topography conditions. Okay, so I discovered the book and I discovered this amazing fact that 2,000 years ago, Ren Laban was laid out on these axes. Well, one day I got out my map and I drew those axes on my map and on a whim, I also added the 45 degree line that I'd been obsessing about. And I was staring at the map and I suddenly realised that the angle between the 15 degree bearing and the 45 degree bearing is, of course, 30 degrees. Well, 30 degrees, of course, is the division of 360 into 12. And the thought suddenly crossed my mind, is there one of these zodiacs that Professor Jean Rocher has found throughout the, throughout the Mediterranean basin? Is it possible that there's one of these landscape zodiacs based around Rand Laban? Well, the answer is yes, there is. And I was able to fill in the, the remaining lines and find that several of the lines went through some extraordinary alignments. This one here is the best. It goes through Chateau Blanchefort, another of these incredible Templar chateaus, a very prominent rock called Rock Negra. But the other alignments, the, the Decumanus from Ren Le Bun actually goes to Ren Le Chateau over there. That's why the sign in the centre square of Ren Le Bun says La Place de Deux Rennes, because the two Rennes are connected by the Decumanus. And so here was a full 12-fold division of the landscape around Ren Laban, mimicking the zodiac form that Jean Rocher had found elsewhere. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to splice in here another element of the Ren Le Chateau mystery. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is probably something you may not have heard of. But for those who are Ren Le Chateau tragics, as we call ourselves, this is a key part of the Renle Chateau mystery. It's a poem called Le Serpent Rouge, The Red Serpent, a very, very strange and mysterious poem which appeared in the 1960s. Now, in this poem, an unknown protagonist takes a walk around an unnamed landscape through 
various stanzas, each stanza of which is allocated to a zodiac sign. And for 50 years, people have tried to figure out what this poem is about, where it's set, what's going on. Well, the answer is that the poem is actually set on the zodiac of Ren Laban, as I call it. And this red line represents a path that you can walk around in to this day that takes you on a walk around the village, or as one might call it, a circumambulation of the village, in which one traverses around the zodiac line and passes through each sign of the zodiac in turn. Now, if you take the poem of La Serpent Rouge, you can actually identify several places in the poem, and they are located in the stanza of a particular sign of the zodiac and now when you compare it it turns out that they're in the correct sign so for example in the poem they're trying to get down here to this spring the source de la madalan and it's in the leo stanza and around the poem so for those that are interested in le serpent rouge again please refer to my book for details but this is uh, amazingly enough, the solution to Le Serpent Rouge after 50 years. It is a walk around the village of Ren Laban on the true ancient zodiac of Ren Laban, which in turn was based on the Cardo Decumanus axes of the original Roman layout of the village. And again, I got a video. So this time we're going to uh, let's see. We're going to zoom in and just do a quick little uh, twirl around the zodiac of Ren Laban, again, to give you an idea of the sensational, superb, spectacular landscape here. And just notice how ideal it is for this sort of landscape geometry work with lots of high points, lots of valleys in between, everything nice and accessible. These aren't the high peaks of the Pyrenees and it's not the flat plains of, of France. It's this lovely zone in between which is ideally suited for these purposes. There's Peshkardot as we go around. There's Roc Negra and Chateau Blanchefort. And there's Ren Le Chateau. And I think the video stops there. So there's Ren Le Chateau. We're now looking due west. And in fact, up there is the village of Far, where I used to live. And that Far Tower was somewhere up there. So I would, I would look back across there. All right, so that's the zodiac of Ren Laban. But the 45 degree alignment still had not quite given up all its secrets. This one literally took me 20 years of staring at this alignment. Until one day, the idea occurred to me, you know what, maybe this 45 degree alignment is meant to be the diagonal of a square. Well, maybe it is. Well, then I noticed that the longitude values of this side of the square, so I drew the square in, okay, there it is, I've drawn a square. There's nothing else marking any of the other sides or the corners, so at the moment it's just a figment of my imagination. But notice how the left-hand side is at 2 degrees, 16 minutes, zero seconds east and the right hand side is at two degrees 22 minutes zero seconds east so that means that there's six arc minutes difference between the left and right sides now six arc minutes is a tenth of a degree remember 60 arc minutes is a degree so this square that i've come up with in my mind happens to be exactly one tenth of a degree of longitude in width i thought okay well that's interesting well let me take it further all right so now i've just drop down and we're having a look at in perspective i also noticed that la val dieu the meridian as we talked about in part one that's two degrees 18 minutes zero seconds so that's exactly one third of the way along so we've got a square six arc minutes in width divided into two arc minutes and four arc minutes well already i'm starting to think well this is pretty impressive given that this is just a figment of my imagination there's already quite a lot going on all right, so my next question was, what is the midline of the square? Well, to determine the midline of the square, I had to determine the coordinates of those two endpoints. So if we start at the lower left-hand corner, St. Just et la Bezu, I noticed that the 2 degrees, 16 minutes, 0 seconds meridian fell exactly on the door of the church there. So I said, okay, that's good enough for me, I'll fix that there. Now at the other end, here's the Chateau Arc, and here's this compound that I, sh I showed you at the beginning. When I look closely, I notice that the chateau itself didn't fall on exactly 2 degrees, 22 minutes, 0 seconds, but the corner of the compound did. It was absolutely accurate, perfectly accurate. So I decided to fix the corner of my arc square there, and now I had my arc square fixed. Okay, so that... Now that I knew the latitude lines at the top and bottom, I was able to divide that in two and find the midline. 
Okay, so here we go now. So now I've drawn the square and the midline. And to my amazement, as I followed the midline across here to the left, I discovered that it came unerringly to Campania Sur Ode, which you will recall, I'm sure, from part one, was the headquarters of the Knights Templar in this entire area. Well, that was pretty impressive, I thought, to find their most important site literally marking the midline of the square. But then I also noticed that if I measure the distance from Campania so Ode to these two sites, to these two corners of the square, it's exactly 250,000 inches. And it's an exact 40 degree angle. So we have a pair of right angle triangles here, 40 degrees, 250,000 inches, determining this displacement from Campania so Ode away from that western side of the square. Moreover, this line here passes exactly through yet another of these chateaux. This one's called the Chateau des Ducs de Joyeuse. It's a magnificent building, fully restored today as a fine hotel and a lovely restaurant. I've actually given a presentation on my work in a room exactly there where the line actually goes through the building. But this line to the corner actually passes through the, the, the chateau. This is the village of Campagne sur Ode from the air. And you'll notice that the centre of this village is like a bullseye. It has this perfect circle of buildings, including the church here. And the midline essentially is tangent to that circle of buildings. And then there's this road that runs around it. And uh, so, so, so that's the village of Campania sur Ode. There's a close up of the line passing, you know, literally exactly through this chateau. I mean, so here's a view looking east. Here's Campania sur Ode looking directly due east. Here's the square. There's the lines to the two corners. Okay, so let me just make this as a diagram now. So now I wanted to ask myself, okay, fine, well, what's the width of the square? So I knew now the latitude of the midline. I'd calculated that from the end points. It's 42.916 degrees north. So I looked up online. You can look up tables of Earth values. And I found out that one-tenth of a degree of longitude at that level on the Earth Corresponds to 321,464 inches. Okay, don't worry too much about the number, but that is the width of the square in inches as I defined it. So then when I check the trigonometry, if I now calculate the side based on the trigonometry of these, of, of these triangles, so for example, let, you know, is this just a lucky fluke that these triangles happen to match? You know, how close really is it? Or have I fudged those numbers? Is it really 39.5? Well, here's how the, the calculation works out. To calculate the side of the square, it's 250,000 times the sine of 40 degrees times 2. Crunch that into calculator, it's 321,394 inches, a mere 70 inches difference over 5 miles. The width of this square is like five, more than 5 miles, and these two calculations differ by 70 inches, which to me is starting to indicate that we're dealing with a deliberate intended set of deliberately laid out measures and geometries at large scale. All right, so my next thought was to look at that 250,000 inches and to remember this idea that I've always had. Maybe the ancients used a scale map of, 100, of 1 to 25,000 to do this. I thought, well, that's convenient, isn't it? Because think of what this would look like on a 1 to 25,000 scale map. That would be 10 inches long, right? 250,000 inches will be represented by 10 inches on a 1 to 25,000 scale map. So here we go. Now I've drawn what the arc square looks like on a 1 to 25,000 scale map. Over the left, 10 degrees, uh, sorry, 40 degrees and 10 inches. All right, I hope, are you following? I hope I'm not sort of crunching the numbers too quickly here, but... What would be the width of this square then on the map? Well, it's going to be the width divided by 25,000. And the answer to that is 12.856 inches. 12.856 inches. Okay, great. Well, that meant nothing to me. So I converted that to millimetres. It's 326.6 millimetres. It still meant nothing to me. It's nothing. So I went online and I punched 326.6 millimetres in to see if by any remote chance it might happen to correspond to some ancient unit of measure. And I discovered to my amazement, that it is the exact distance of the pied du roi, the foot of the king, 
which was the f- main foot used in France from the time of Charlemagne and possibly even earlier than that, in the 8th century AD, all the way through to the 17th century. So for over a thousand years, the main unit of measure used for length in France was the pied du roi of 326.6 millimetres. And this process, where I started with the diagonal, I had a rush of blood to my head that maybe it's a square, maybe it's significant. I put it on a 1 to 25,000 scale map, and the width of the square on the map is precisely one pied du roi. At this point, I stopped thinking that this was a figment of my imagination and concluded that I've stumbled upon a genuine ancient piece of exquisite, accurate geometry laid out in the landscape. So here's a summary of what we've just seen. The width of the square is one-tenth of a degree in longitude. It's six arc minutes. It's 360 arc seconds, because there's 60 arc seconds in an arc minute. It's 321,464 inches, or it's 25,000 pieds du roi, because if it's one pied du roi on a 1 to 25,000 scale map, then in the landscape, this square is exactly 25,000 pied du roi in width, which is an extraordinary result considering that I determined the width based on a whim and to find out that it is literally exactly that amount with no margin ever. Now, I might also... Uh, well, let me go to the next step. All right, so <clears throat> things are getting a bit complicated now. This probably takes an hour and a cup of coffee to really understand this diagram, but the Laval Dieu meridian ties together the Boudet map and the, gri- and the arc square. Because the Laval Dieu meridian is one of these calibrated meridians and it's also the one third division line of the arc square. So that means you can mash everything up here and produce a single diagram, which is literally no fudging. And that's, you know, for those of you who are familiar with the kind of books in this area, landscape art, geography, Renle Chateau, there's a lot of fudging that goes on in these books. There's a lot of results that you look at and you think, that's fantastic. And when you test it, nah, the guys, there's no fudging in this diagram. It's literally perfect. And moreover, observe this. The width of the square is 360 arc seconds. That's equal to 25,000 pieds de roi. And the difference between the two calibrated meridians is 28 arc seconds, and that's equal to 25,000 inches. But look at that. We have this incredible relationship with whole numbers between arc seconds, inches, and pieds de roi. And moreover, this relationship only occurs literally at this latitude. Literally, if you go up as far as this side of the square, it breaks apart. It's not true here, and it's not true here. It's only true at the latitude of the centre of the square. These results are perfectly accurate, and this geometry has been positioned at the perfectly accurate place on on the Earth's surface where these relationships obtain, with literally zero margin for ever, margin of error. So this, frankly... You know, blows my mind. And I'll just point this, if you just look at this, notice this 360 arc seconds is 25,000 pied du roi, 28 arc seconds is 25,000 inches. That means, if you look at that, that the number of pied du roi, the number of inches in a pied du roi must be 360 divided by 28. And indeed it is. 360 divided by 28 equals 12.858 inches, which is the number of inches in the pied du roi. Honestly, you're not going to get that straight away. Please, go in a quiet room and think about that for 90 minutes with a cup of coffee and it'll blow your mind. All right, so here I've zoomed out a bit. Here's the arc square at the bottom, now familiar. Now, this blue line up here is a fascinating alignment. It's at an angle of exactly 330 degrees bearing. It passes through the cathedral at the town of alet Laban. Now, this is a very interesting walled town and it's at the head of the valley it's the first town even today when you drive in from the airport at Carcassonne you drive in you, you come up this valley and Alet Laban is the first town an extraordinary ruined cathedral uh, is, is there very spectacular Nostradamus lived in this town for a while you can still visit his house and see mystical symbols that he's carved on the front so it also then passes through another five villages or churches here an absolutely perfect line now the amazing thing about this is i discovered this line back in 2014 it's perfectly accurate and it extends across the flat plains of france here which is unusual most of the geography the geometry is is in this hilly area but this one line goes over the plains but it always bugged me that the line never seemed to go anywhere it missed 
Renle Renle Barn Church by a couple of hundred meters, and that bugged me. I could never work out why. And then I discovered the Ark Square in 2018, and only then did I discover that this line, without any alteration, points unerringly exactly at the center of the square. I literally didn't have to shift a single bookmark on my uh, Google Earth. So the center of the square is marked by the intersection of the latitude line through Campania Sir Ode, the headquarters of the Templars, and this extraordinary 330 degree bearing through the cathedral. And these two lines pinpoint the center of the square. This is the way that that line passes one of those villages. Have a look at this, Kyle Harvel. So just go back, there it is, it's the second village at the top. And now I've zoomed in. The village has this amazing circular structure and the line literally passes exactly tangent. And you can see that there's actually a road running along there and the line actually runs along the road. So we're looking at absolutely real things here and and not imagination. And I've got another one of these great little videos. So we'll just have a swoop in and see what it looks like. There's the square. Now swing around and look at uh, the view to the east from Campania Sir Ode, across to the Mediterranean. And then there's the line extending across. See how it's on the plains here? Pointing directly at the center of the square. All right. Well, I just want to pick up one last thing about the Bugarach baseline and the sunrise line, which I showed you in, in the first. I always wondered. It always bothered me this angle of the sunrise line. Why is it this weird angle? It was like 74 degrees. It wasn't, didn't really seem to fit with anything. But what I did notice is that this northern point on the Bulgarach baseline, Jerb de Baku, is actually the sighting point for the La Valdure meridian. So that gives us an opportunity to have a look at the meridians in relation to the sunrise line. So in this diagram, I've dropped out all the other meridians except the La Valdure meridian. And I want to point out this extraordinary next fact. The relationship between Campania Sir Ode and Gerbe de Baku is exactly 500,000 inches away and it makes a perfect Pythagorean 345 triangle. This side is 300,000 inches, this side is 400,000 inches, this side is 500,000 inches. It's a 345 Pythagorean triangle laid out in units of 100,000 inches in the landscape perfectly separating Campania Sa'od from that meridian in Jerv de Baku. But that's not all. The same triangle can also be drawn here. 500,000, 300,000, 400,000. There's two 3, 4, 5 triangles locked together and that gives you the answer to the angle of that line because the angle of that line is the difference between the two angles of a 3, 4, 5 triangle. And guess what? There's another triangle again. If you reflect that triangle in the sunrise line down there, well, this point falls on Bugarach. And there's another 500,000, 400,000, 300,000. So now we have two, three, see them? Three symmetric, three, four, five Pythagorean triangles perfectly laid out here on this sunrise line. But notice something else. This 300,000 inch Length here is divided in half by that point there and divided in half by that point there. Well, if you remember the start of my talk, you recall that I pointed out that Henry Lincoln had pointed out that this very line was divided into three equal parts and I had found that those three parts were 150,000. Well, 20 years later, I discovered that there was a fourth segment, that these are four segments of 150,000 inches because they are two lengths of 300,000 inches because they're the two sides of these Pythagorean triangles. Now, I thought, well, come on, this is getting a bit out of hand. Surely they didn't have Pythagorean geometry back when this stuff was being laid out in the megalithic era or whenever it was. Until one day I was watching a presentation on the geometry at Karnak in France by a guy called Howard Crowhurst, whose work you might be familiar with. And I nearly fell off the chair when he brought up this slide of this tablet that was dug up from a Babylonian palace dated to 1700 BC and it depicts a pair of three four five triangles with this other triangle in here I could see at a glance that this was the identical geometry to what I'd found it I could not even believe this this is even this is the Babylonian marking so it's a 50 30 40 triangle and here's here's what happens when I take that triangle and literally overlay it on the geometry at the same 
scale it's an absolutely perfect fit this babylonian tablet depicts without any fudging the exact geometry that's on display in the Renle Chateau area at a scale of 1 to 10,000. So on the tablet, the, the triangles are 30, 40, 50. In the landscape, they're 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 inches. So that's kind of insane. <coughs> well, you know, they, they really did used to do this. This is a diagram from a, a fascinating book called Pantometria by a guy called Leonard Diggs. It came out in the late 16th century in London. And this is a depiction. The book is full of pictures like this. It's a depiction of how they... These guys here, these landscape geometers, could determine the distance to far off things that they couldn't physically access. You see these guys over here, they want to know how far it is to this castle. There's rivers in between, so you can't measure it. So how do you do it? You lay out this geometry, you start off with these small triangles that you lay out on flat ground of known dimension, and then you extrapolate them, and then by trigonometry, you can, clever maths, you can work out how far it is to these, uh, to these far. So this is what's, this is what's happening at Campania. So they're, they're using a, a simple grid diagram that they've created here. And as you can see, this is a three by four rectangle, or the diagonal is five. So what you do is you lay out a grid like that. You, you, you make a grid, you align it to the line, and then you just peel off the angles that you need to just essentially draw the points. And, and now you lay that down on the ground, and now you can cite across the landscape, you can extrapolate out and you can create then these known shapes by starting off with a, with a small shape of known dimension, known angles, using your grid techniques and then expanding it out. <coughs> so this is just pulling out again another layer of zoom. Here was the peak to St. Barthélemy that I, I showed you at the beginning. It, it turns out that that, that this Cordier de Fenier at the bottom of the Bugarache baseline, it's essentially due east of Pic de Saint Barthélemy. So there's another large triangle here, and you know, there's lots going in there. And yeah. Okay, so please look at my book for the details um, on this. Okay, so <clears throat> we're, nearly, we're nearly done. There's one last concept that I'd like to share with you. So uh, let's imagine we were going to mark a meridian in mountain peaks. Okay, well, there's two problems. The first is we've got to have enough human power to obviously shift the mountains around. Obviously, that's going to be a problem. But let's say that we've got that sorted. There's an even more crucial problem. In order to accurately align something north-south, you need a way to do that. And there's actually no really easy, good way to repeatedly find the direction of north-south. You can, you can put a stick and you, the sun's shadow, and you can, I mean, that's a terrible, terrible way. You can use a compass, but that's magnetic. You still, so there's actually no simple, straightforward way to reliably, repeatedly, accurately determine the distance, the, the direction south. So how do they do that? Because if they didn't have a method, then you could have all the manpower you would want. You wouldn't be able to align these meridians. So I decided to, I, I figured out the answer had to be something to do with the stars. So what I did was look at one of these star software programs and just look to the south. Go, go to megalithic times and look to the south. All right, so here now, this is a, this is the sky looking south from Giza, the Great Pyramid, 30 degrees north latitude. Once you look over here, so over here, first of all, some familiar, there's Sirius, okay, there's Orion, so some, some familiar constellations. But over here is a, con is a constellation which won't be as familiar. It's the Southern Cross, crux, about to rise. Say what? What's that? The Southern Cross isn't visible from Europe? how right you are. Today, it's no longer visible from Europe. But in megalithic times, because of the precession of the equinoxes, because the vault of the heavens slowly changes with time, the Southern Cross was, was visible from northern latitudes. Now, it so happens that the Southern Cross is actually the brightest constellation in the sky when defined as star magnitude per unit, per unit area. And as anyone who grew up living in Australia knows, it's the most instantly recognisable constellation. It's, you learn it, it's the first constellation. You can always find it. Now, this, I want to show you what you see when you're at 4400 BC and you're in Giza looking south. So let's do it now. All right, so the Southern Cross rises. We're looking due south, okay, to the horizon. Here comes the Southern Cross. Now, see how it it's like a kite, and now it starts to stand upright. In other words, and just notice that about now, the top and bottom stars are above each other. Now it's starting to tilt over. It crosses the meridian, tilting over. Do you see that? And now it continues on its way, and it's going to set in the west here. 
All right, that's 4400 BC. Now I want you to see what happens a thousand years later. We're going to stay in the same spot, but we're going to go to 3400 BC. Here we are. Now the Southern Cross has risen slightly lower in the sky. And watch it, here it goes. Now it's starting to stand upright, but it stands upright slightly over closer to the meridian. There. Now it crosses just over. Okay, fine. Now let's see what happens in another thousand years. 2400 BC. It's even lower in the sky. Here it comes. And this time, when it's upright, it's really getting quite close to the meridian. As you can see, it's there. It's upright. All right. Let's do it one more time. Now 1400 BC. And here's the exciting one. Much lower in the sky now. Here it comes. And now I'll see if I can stop it exactly. And now, okay, there it is. I'm just slightly past. But can you see that? The top star and the bottom star of the Southern Cross transit the meridian at the same time. The Southern Cross is upright at 1400 BC, and it's the only time that happens. Now, that is very useful because think about it. You could then take a pendulum, you could take a, a string with a rock and hang it up and it gives you a vertical line and you could wait and watch for the Southern Cross to rise. And you could wait until you saw the Southern Cross was upright, that the two stars were exactly in line with your vertical line. At that exact moment, you know that that direction is very accurately due south. And that result is going to be good for about 100 years. You can teach it to your kids. And it means that you are going to be able to spend the next three generations, if you so choose, marking meridians into the landscape very easily because it means every single night, or six months of the year anyway, you can go out and you can have this accurate, repeatable, simple, repeatable determination of due south using this trick of the Southern Cross at that time. Now, as time goes on, it then, uh, it then gets lower and lower in the sky. Here we go. That's 1400 BC. I'll just show you the next one. CC. So here it is in 400 BC, and it's much lower again. And as time goes on, it disappears below the horizon, so you can't see it any longer from there. All right, so let's just go back to when it was upright, if I can. Okay, I want to point out something. That star there is 15 degrees above the horizon. So you think about this idea. At Giza, I mean, it's pretty good, but unfortunately, it's a little bit It's difficult because it's up there in the sky, right? It's 15 degrees, so it's not as convenient. This would be ideal if the Southern Cross was just above the horizon, right? It'd be perfect because then you could hold it up and you'd be looking like that. So ideally, you would want that bottom star two degrees above the horizon because that's about the limit you can see of a star. So work with me here. Giza's at 30 degrees latitude. That star's at 15 degrees above that. So if you want to see that star two degrees above the horizon, you would need to go up 13 degrees of latitude on the surface of the Earth. So you would need to go to 30 plus 13, 43 degrees north latitude. Okay. So from 43 degrees north latitude, anywhere in the world at 1400 BC, you would see this incredible sight of the Southern Cross transiting the meridian just above the horizon. Now, 43 degrees, uh, 43 degrees north latitude runs exactly through the Ren Laban area. So here I've made this lovely mashup diagram. This is the Peshkar Do meridian. This is Peshkar Do. This is the landscape. We're looking south. Here it is here. We're at 1400 BC. And now here we go. Here comes the Southern Cross over here. It's rising. I hope you can see it nicely. There's the top star. All right, here comes the bottom star. Okay, so there it is now. And now it's approaching due south. And let's see if I can freeze it. Okay, there. There, the Southern Cross majestically stands in the sky, perfectly upright above your meridian. Now, imagine it's night. Imagine you've got eight groups of your friends on each of these other peaks imagine that everyone has lit a fire on their peak i mean it's freezing so you're going to keep warm so it makes sense right and now we're watching and we see these eight fires one above the other and hanging in the heavens above the two stars of the southern cross and that lasts that moment lasts for about two minutes in the sky and it's a very very special moment 
It's not like astronomy now. In astronomy now, we just look at the stars and it's a passive thing. And if we want to take a photo, we just use a camera. But the human is not really part of it. We're just looking. And, but this is different. The human here is an integral part of what's going on. And this isn't just about getting a, a direct south bearing. It's about bringing a unity into sky and land and the human heart in between. So we have this extraordinary moment of two or three minutes where everything is in alignment. The sky, the earth, and the humans. And everyone's intent is focused. And this link is established geometrically between the stars and the peaks and the fires and the human hearts. Now, I'd like to suggest that something very, very special potentially took place during that moment, which made this whole thing very worthwhile and worth doing quite apart from the mere astronomical aspects to it. Okay, folks, well, well, that's pretty much I've come to the end of my journey. That is a summary of some of the key results that I've come to in this last uh, 25 years of wrestling with this extraordinary set of problems. I must say there's a lot more, and I've crammed it into 90 minutes. It, but please, my book is available at the back. This is my book. came out in 2022, published by Ignotum Press of Manchester. It's called The Map and the Manuscript. Journeys and the Mysteries of the Two Wren, hardback, paperback, Kindle, available from the Great British Bookshop, Amazon, all usual outlets. Uh, I have a website, I have a YouTube channel where I have all these high-resolution videos and several others, and you're very welcome to get in touch with me uh, there, and I hope to meet some or all of you this afternoon. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.